Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry to keep you waiting. We just had some uh, technical glitches there. Um, welcome to this bright blue Lodgate, late Lodgate lecture. Uh, for those of you who don't know Bright Blue, we're an independent think tank for liberal conservatism. We see our role as bringing together the liberal and conservative traditions to vet, explain and change government policy. Uh, our Lodgate lectures are a monthly series online where we bring some of the most thoughtful and interesting speakers. Uh, they give us a talk. We ask them questions. Um, and we like to be inspired and challenged uh, by those speakers. Um, so for those of you who want to ask questions, and I hope you will, um, under the YouTube video is a Slido link. Uh, so please do tell us who you are and what your question is. Uh, and today's Ludgate lecture is with uh, Professor Matthew Goodwin on the impact of the new elite. Uh, and Matthew is a professor of political science at the University of Kent, uh, and he was uh, until recently a senior fellow at the Legatum Institute uh, and also a senior advisor to the UK Education Select Committee. Uh, he's the author of six books uh, and most recently authored the best-selling Values, Voice and Virtue, The New British Politics. He also has a Substack, uh, so please do subscribe to that as well. And I think Matthew's become quite a prominent UK commentator, arguing that the votes that we had in the late 2010s represented a cry for change from individuals from so-called left-behind communities, who he thinks a liberal, metropolitan, highly educated class are still misunderstanding and ignoring. So Matthew's going to speak for about 20 minutes. We're then going to have a Q&A and then we're going to open up to questions from you. So, Matthew, over to you. The impact of the new elite. Well, thank you uh, very much for the um, kind introduction, um, Ryan. And uh, if I can just um, thank people for joining us and, and those people who are viewing uh, later later on online. Um, what I want to do over the course of uh, 20 minutes is basically set out the uh, the thesis of um, of my book, uh, Values, Voice and Virtue, The New British Politics, which essentially begins with the question, how do we explain the three big rebellions that have reshaped British politics over the last decade? The rise of Nigel Farage and the UK Independence Party, later the Brexit Party, uh, the vote for Brexit in 2016, which of course was a major shock for many people within the political and cultural class. Um, and then uh, really between 2017 and 2019, the, the, the post-Brexit realignment of our politics that was symbolised by Boris Johnson's victory in 2019, the 80-seat majority, the collapse of the Red Wall, um, and the reshaping of a Conservative Party and its electorate in a much more working-class, non-graduate and older uh, direction. Um, and so what I'm really trying to say in the book is, you know, we've had many, I think, misleading explanations about what, what caused all of that churn and change or that trilogy of acts, if you like. We, we've had much discussion about um, social media, even the role of Russia, what was written on the side of a of a red bus, um, the legacy of the financial crisis, um, the specifics of, of particular campaigns, a Brexit campaign, Boris Johnson and 2019, Dominic Cummings and so on. Um, but actually what I've tried to do in the book is step back and say, I think we, we actually have a much bigger problem in this country. I think we have a much a much deeper rooted crisis within our political system and society, which really centers on the rise of who I call the new elite, a, a new ruling class in the country that is not, not dominating the country on its own, but is increasingly competing um, with, with an old elite for economic, political, social, and cultural power. Um, and what do I mean by this term new elite? I'm referring mainly to a new graduate class, um, university educated middle class professionals who typically went to Oxbridge or Russell Group institutions, whose parents are often members of the professional class who have grown up in relative financial security, if not affluence, who tend to live in the big cities, the university towns, who, as Mike Savage, a sociologist has shown, tend to be the most socially exclusive group in British society, they're more likely to marry other members of the uh, of their of their class. They're, they're more likely to to live in neighborhoods that are heavily concentrated by members of the same 
of the same class. They're also um, significantly more politically intolerant of people who hold different political beliefs, different values. Um, they're more likely to unfriend people on Facebook who hold different political beliefs. They're more likely to block people on Twitter who hold different political beliefs. And they're more likely to say they would feel uncomfortable if their son or daughter married somebody from the other political tribe. And the new the new elite over the last 30 years have really consolidated their power in a number of ways. Um, firstly, they've moved into the cities and the university towns if they weren't there already. So they've essentially consolidated by dominating the epicenters of economic power in our national life. They've benefited from the rapid um, increase in, in house prices. They've benefited from higher rates of economic growth in what is the most um, regionally imbalanced country in in Europe, really, and certainly Western Europe. Um, they've not really been exposed to the left behind areas that, of course, were the target of leveling up uh, policy. They've consolidated their power, secondly, by dominating and expanding the higher education system, which between the 1990s and the early 2010s mainly dominated the children of their class more than other children in society. Vicky Bolivar at the University of, Man of Manchester has shown that the children of professional middle class families were the main beneficiaries of the expansion of higher education, especially in terms of gaining access to elite institutions. Um, and at the same time, our investment in non-graduate training, non-graduate vocational training and education, as uh, as as the government, uh, as various reviews over the last few years have shown, um, was really downplayed, um, if not if not ignored altogether, at least until we started to discuss adult skills and retraining in a more serious way. Um, and so the only real metric of success in British society under the new elite became having a university degree from the right university. Um, and uh, that also became an important source of social status, which I'll come back to. But the new elite have also consolidated uh, their power over time by dominating the most important and influential institutions in society. So when I talk about their power, I'm not just talking about economic power. I'm also talking about political and cultural power. The new graduate elite dominate disproportionately institutions like the BBC, the creative industries, the cultural institutions, the museums, the galleries, House of Commons, the two political parties. Uh, and one of the big misinterpretations of my book when it came out, clearly from people who might not have read it, um, was that, well, how can we have a new elite? How can we uh, how can these people be marginalized if we've had a conservative party in power for 13 years? Um, what they didn't really understand is that the new elite is present on both the right and the left. It leans much more strongly to the cultural left on on social and cultural issues, um, which is why the Conservative Party, particularly since 2019, as we've seen in the events this week, um, has really um, failed to hold the support of many of the people who rallied to it in 2019. So the new elite have consolidated their power. And what's important about this group is that over the last 10 years, partly in response to things like Brexit and Trump, um, the new elite have drifted leftwards on cultural questions. So they've become more supportive of immigration, more supportive of diversity, more supportive of multiculturalism, more supportive of tackling climate change, more supportive of expanding minority group rights, of gender identity theory, um, even maybe imposing things like critical race theory in, in institutions. Um, and as they've moved leftwards, they've they've tended to take some of the institutions with them. So this is not a conspiracy. This is simply what academics would call education polarization. As a graduate class have drifted leftwards on cultural questions, non-graduates and also some graduates from less prestigious institutions. You know, we tend to forget one in four graduates voted for Brexit. Um, but but uh, non-graduates or, or, or a section of the graduate class have either stayed still or have drifted rightwards. So we've had this polarization around education, which has become much more prominent in our politics, uh, much more prominent in, in our society. And that helps to explain why, for example, we've seen the institutions respond in the way they have. Since the book was published, for example, we've seen that the banking scandal with Nigel Farage, we've seen civil servants threaten to strike if they're asked to implement policies that are pursued by a democratically elected government. We saw the remarkable story yesterday about the Home Office uh, civil servants um, actively campaigning against policies such as reducing migration or strengthening the country's borders. Um, we've seen um, the universities fail to condemn unequivocally the actions of Hamas. 
um, but fall over themselves to express allegiance with Black Lives Matter, uh, a revolutionary movement that has since aligned itself with Hamas terrorists. So when we look at the institutions generally, we can see a creeping politicization, which I think reflects this process of education polarization over the last 10 years, 15 years. And that's left many people feeling, I think understandably, as though their values, their alternative values on issues like migration, law and order, crime, multiculturalism, diversity, minority rights versus the majority, um, has left them feeling as though their values are no longer really respected and included in the national conversation. Their voice is no longer really heard in the conversation because they're not really present in the institutions. And 90% of our media class, for example, are drawn from university graduates. Half of them have gone to elite universities. Local and regional media, which used to provide pathways into the media, have collapsed. It's almost impossible to get into the media now unless you pass through the elite institutions or you you happen to have parents who also work in media or can basically put you up in London for internships and so on. Um, And in the same way, our political class has become overwhelmingly dominated by the same groups, which is why some academics refer to our democracies now as diploma democracies, democracies that are basically shaped around the interests and the values and the priorities of a relatively small minority university educated class. And we should remember, you know, we hear a lot about the liberalisation of Britain. But if you look at the British Social Attitude Survey, the very latest edition that just came out, that shows that only 20% of Britain are consistently and strongly liberal on an array of issues. Only one in five of us are consistently expressing what I would call the liberal consensus that, that, pervade, that pervades the institutions and this new elite ruling class that is passionately supportive of immigration, that is passionately supportive of diversity in all its forms, which tends to think that Britain is a, an institutionally racist society or expands social norms like racism and transphobia and Islamophobia to try and silence or stigmatize voices that that people disagree with. And this, I think, has been exacerbated by a particular group within the new elite, uh, the sort of radical progressives. And if you look at some of the really good work done by Moore in Common, which is a pretty centrist think tank and a a, a very good one, I would add, I'm, I'm a big fan of their work. They show that radical progressives now constitute about 15% of Britain's population. Um, They too tend to come from the elite universities. They tend to be financially secure, if not affluent. They live in the cities. And radical progressives are really a subset of the new elite who are also very visible in universities, cultural institutions, creative industries, but who have a very unique view of the world. They believe racism is endemic in British society. They think we cannot move on unless we stop to revisit historic injustices that happened 300 years ago. They will happily sacrifice free speech on the altar of social justice. If they feel that social justice is being compromised by free speech or challenging questions, they would rather narrow the marketplace of ideas and free expression uh, than sacrifice their ideological goals. Which is why writers like John McWhorter have referred to radical progressivism or what some people have called woke ideology as a new religion on the basis that the people who fall into that movement are are pseudo religious. You know, they they are um, organized around rituals, around taking the knee, around um, uh, expressing their politics through hashtags and complex vocabulary like white privilege and intersectionality. And they also derive their status from those beliefs in a way that the old elite didn't used to do. The old elite were primarily focused on winning social status and projecting social status through money, through family estates, through titles, through um, uh, demonstrating their wealth uh, and their material possessions, and maybe also their leisure time, their ability to have holidays and to um, play polo and whatever and go to private members clubs. Uh, The new elite, I'm arguing, are increasingly deriving their status by projecting these luxury beliefs, by projecting these beliefs like gender ideology, critical race theory, and imposing these beliefs on everybody else. And luxury beliefs are those beliefs which bring the new elite few costs, but bring everybody else much bigger costs. Mass immigration would be one. Um, Relaxed, weak national borders would be another. Um, Encouraging large large numbers of refugees from Gaza or um, 
uh, Ukraine would 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 be another uh, ushering in unbridled uh, globalization and free trade would would be another many things which have now been shown to disproportionately negatively impact workers in western democracies and which the new elite are not really going to feel the full consequences of so in- increasingly this group has been imposing its values not just because you know they they believe in them they want to make the world a better place and generally they're they're nice people but also because they're trying to derive a sense of status and moral righteousness by projecting these beliefs and so increasingly as we've gone over time i think voters have been sensing that what they are now being exposed to is a very um visible political project in some cases being driven by activists who are not liberal at all and i don't think it's plausible today as it as some people argued 10 years ago to say that um things like the, the radicalization of the left the radicalization of the cultural left um is something that we don't need to worry about or you know woke ideology doesn't exist as an example um it's now accepted on the left by thinkers like yashka munk and, and susan neiman and mark lilla and francis fukuyama in the center or the center right as well as thinkers on the right like richard hananier or christopher rufo or eric kaufman that woke ideology is actually a fundamental challenge to our society that it is fundamentally illiberal that it is revolutionary it wants to overthrow our institutions um it is divisive in that it 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 undermines individual rights in the name of fixed group identities our racial sexual gender identities are the only important thing about us in the in the eyes of that ideology and it organizes british society around a very crude simplistic um framework where there are only oppressors the white majority and increasingly Jews uh, and the oppressed minorities, um, Muslims uh, and so on, who are apparently living in an institutionally racist society, despite the fact that minority groups have never done better uh, within our education system and with our, within our employment um, and labor market. Um, so increasingly, as this elite class have drifted away from the rest of society on these cultural issues, it's left a cross-class coalition of voters, working class voters, older voters, cultural conservatives, um, lots of voters in small towns, medium towns, um, uh, coastal communities, um, essentially looking for an alternative, essentially looking for a politics that better represents their values and their voice and respects their sense of identity and, and, and respects who they are. And the conservatives had a unique opportunity to 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 mobilize that group and hold on to that group and i'm sure we'll come and talk about this during the discussion but what we've see, seen since 2019 i think is a reassertion of the new elite a reassertion of its power it's moved to consolidate its uh world view uh people who have openly questioned uh the status quo uh, boris johnson liz truss suella braverman uh for lots of different reasons but nonetheless have been purged from politics have been removed from the public square um there is no longer any frontline cabinet minister that i can think of unless you maybe include esther mcveigh but i don't suspect she'll have much influence in the cabinet there's not a single cabinet minister that i can see who is speaking for the voters that the party won over in 2019 for the first time and I think it's revealing that in recent days, party strategists have openly conceded that they've given up on those voters and they've given up on areas like the Red Wall, um, preferring to redouble their efforts at speaking to other members of the new elite class, to the graduates, to the professionals in the commuter towns uh, and, and areas surrounding London and in the southwest, which I think goes to show again how fun- and ultimately the new elite, which represents somewhere between... 15 and 23 percent of britain it's a very broad amorphous group um really doesn't have much interest actually in in people who challenge its consensus who challenge its worldview and it was a it will come to be seen as the one of the biggest strategic blunders in the history of the conservative party what is about to happen because the conservative party will now slide into a heavy if not historic defeat on the scale of 1997, if you look at the current polling. Um, And will do so precisely because it inherited this unique coalition 
who were fed up with the new elite, fed up with its agenda, wanted to carve out a different kind of politics, and will most likely either now switch over to the Reform Party, which is attracting one in eight of the 2019 Conservative electorate, or will do what they will do, will simply stay at home, will simply not vote at all. Um, and in the aftermath of the next election, hopefully the Conservative Party will ask itself some very tough questions, which is how does it reconnect with those voters? How does it present a compelling and credible alternative to a, an elite liberal consensus, which really has left much of the rest of the country feeling disconnected and and, and disillusioned? Um, and how will it hopefully come back to the country with an offer that is much more in tune with where voters are on issues like immigration, on issues like integration and multiculturalism, on issues like identity, on issues like borders, family, and the future of the country, uh, the place that we all want to strengthen, that we all want to uh, improve. So that essentially is the thesis of the book. And um, I'm happy to take questions. Obviously, Ryan, you, you'll have, we, you and I have a bit of a discussion, and I'm sure people will have some questions. But that's the thesis of the book. And as you can probably tell from my comments, underlying all of it is actually a profound concern about the state of the country and a profound concern that we now appear absolutely determined to repeat the mistakes of our cousins in America and to head into a much more polarized society because we have refused to listen to the lessons of the last 10 years. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Matt. Um, thank you for the very thoughtful, considered contribution. I'm already getting lots of questions come in, so that's great. Um, it's stimulating lots of discussion. But before we come on to people's questions, and just a reminder that you can ask questions through the Slido link at the bottom of your YouTube uh, video. Um, but just before we come on to that, we'll we'll have a bit of a Q and A between ourselves. Uh, and I would say, you know, lots of people in bright blue are that sort of young, urban graduates. Uh, and so, actually, a lot of what you say will be interesting, challenging. Um, so, thank you for coming along. I think the first thing to ask is, uh, you know, I totally agree with you on this sort of stagnant social mobility, that people who don't have professional parents, who don't go to elite universities, who don't live close to London or in London, are finding it difficult to get into those powerful cultural jobs. But I suppose my challenge would be, isn't this just the age old problem? Isn't it the same old elite, the people from private school backgrounds, and they're just using another form of power? So cultural power, status, um, uh, to sort of, and, you know, the whole kind of woke capitalism. Isn't it just people in power using those new tools to reinforce that um, uh, social Im immobility that we've had for a long time? You know, for example, the cabinet, you know, two thirds of the cabinet were privately educated. So isn't that the main problem? It's people from money background, that social class is still the biggest determinant and the new elite is just a sort of offshoot of that. And it's using their kind of voice and their cultural power to reinforce that. I think certainly we've always had issues around social mobility, obviously. But I think I think things are different today for a number of reasons. I think, firstly, the alternative pathways into the institutions that used to be there have broken down. We can think of a few important ones. The presence of trade unions did bring a kind of working class elite into politics in the post-war years. Um, it did diversify the voice, the, the range of voices in parliament. Local and regional media did allow uh, people from outside of, of that group to find their way into the newsroom and, and to have some influence on the national uh, conversation. Um, and I think those pathways today are either much weaker uh, or are simply non-existent. I think the other big difference today is that there's a hypocrisy that goes on within the new elite because we now live in a world where narratives around things like social mobility and meritocracy have become embedded in our national life in a way they certainly weren't 50 years ago or 70 years ago. But at the same time, we refuse to do the things that are genuinely required to deliver on that kind of meritocratic society to maximize equality of opportunity to 
uh, remove barriers for other people to move up. And I give you a few, few examples. If you see our national conversation about diversity, in most institutions, that conversation is principally about racial, sexual and gender diversity and is very rarely about diversity along socioeconomic lines. The BBC would be a good example of that. In fact, it's acknowledged recently that it hasn't been doing enough to get people into one of the most important institutions in the country from alternative uh, uh, backgrounds. Um, and I think also, as I, as, I, as I mentioned, what's different today as well is that increasingly, I think the social mobility agenda and social ladder has in, has become much more ideological than it used to be. The, for the luxury belief class, for the new elite, it's not enough to have the right educational credentials, to, to have gone to the right school and the right university. Increasingly today, um, as Daniel Bell actually first pointed out, um, ideology is also now becoming quite an important marker of acceptance into the ruling class. That if you hold the the right beliefs, the right values, it becomes an important um, stamp of approval. But if you hold the wrong values, the wrong worldview, um, it's very difficult. And I'll give you a real world example. If you're in higher education, it's almost impossible today to get a major research grant or to get a job unless you submit something called a diversity statement, where you have to essentially take a page of A4 and explain why you are committed to diversity equity and inclusion and how your teaching would reflect that and how your research would reflect that and how your research grant would reflect that now you might say well what's the problem with dei and we can maybe have a separate conversation about that my point is that it is an explicitly ideological project and that is an explicitly lit it is a litmus test designed to weed out people who either subscribe to that worldview or people who don't and civil servants have made very similar comments. You know, if you are considered to hold the wrong beliefs today, it's very difficult to progress within those institutions. So what I would say is we are seeing the politicization of public institutions of our national life in a way that I don't think we used to see to the same extent. Um, so I think there are a number of key differences from the past. Great. OK, just moving now on to what you said in the speech around a sort of new elite becoming more culturally left and, you know, leaving behind the rest of the population. So, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding of the British Social Attitude Survey is that across different generations, on most issues, people have become more socially liberal, whether it's on attitudes towards homosexuality, to, um, you know, sex outside of marriage, uh, to mixed race relationships. There seems to have been across all uh, generations a shift to a more socially liberal direction. Admittedly, in the latest British Social Attitude Survey, there was a little bit more scepticism on on the trans front, which um, which I noticed in the statistics. But overall, it seems to have gone in a more socially liberal direction. So that's the first part of my question. The second is, does this not, you know, this sort of radical progressivism? Does it not need to be separated from social liberalism in the sense that radical progressivism is a kind of communalist intersectional view of the world? And you can see it, for example, with attitudes towards Israel. That's the strong group. It belongs to the white moneyed Western group uh, and that's subjugating the poor and the powerless. Um, it is, you know, I, I just sometimes see in discussion um, a kind of convergence of socially liberal attitudes with ra with that kind of radical intersectionality. And I just think perhaps that needs disentangling, considering what I talked about at the beginning of this point, which is the kind of broad social liberalism that we've seen in the population over the past few decades. I, I think those are both great points. Um, on the liberalisation issue, yes, it's true that on some issues we, we, we are liberalising, and in many respects, those are changes we should all welcome, particularly around um, uh, the rights of women, um, attitudes towards same-sex relationships, um, the decline, remarkable decline of racial prejudice in Britain. This is one of the untold stories, by the way, in our national conversation. Um, opposition to intergroup relationships and marriages has fallen off a cliff 
over the last 50 years, if you look at the, the BSA and, and, and the social surveys. But that's not true on all issues. Um, if you look at issues around crime, morality, some issues around some questions around migration, I would argue that actually we still remain instinctively, particularly outside of the university towns and particularly outside of the graduate class and the elite graduate class, we actually still just about remain an, an instinctively small C conservative country. Um, and I've shown this. I mean, I've written about this in the Substack. If you look at, for example, at some of the things Suella Braverman has said around migration being an existential challenge, multiculturalism not not really working, migration, migrants not really integrating into British society. Um, those are majority views. Those are held by over 50 percent, sometimes over 60 percent of the country. Rwanda, we tend to forget the Rwanda plan rejected by the Supreme Court, but was supported by more Brits than opposed it. Um, and uh, sometimes the liberalization narrative is pushed, I would argue, too far, partly because it reflects and corroborates the ideological priors of people who really want to believe that actually we are rapidly liberalizing. There are also a number of counter trends to that, which people tend to overlook. My daughter is two years old. Um, by the time she turns 28, um, which is, I would consider very young, <laughs> um, being in my 40s, um, the share of Britain's population uh, that is Muslim will increase from 6% to about 18%. If you look at the Pew Research Centre estimates, and they're pretty, I would say they're very, you know, as Pew Research Centre, I don't think you could call a, you know, a, a right wing uh, uh, centre. They're pretty bang in the middle. Um and as we know, some of the changes that we've seen in attitudes around sex and gender, um, same-sex relationships and so on, um, is not shared by uh, some members of minority communities. Um, and I think that's going to increasingly become apparent. Indeed, it already is in areas like, like Birmingham and elsewhere, where there have been very, very robust debates about teaching and curriculum and schooling. So there are counters to this um the right would drift of hispanic latino voters in america would be another example of that of a political shift that doesn't quite chime with the demography is destiny argument so there are things to 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 keep our eyes on um the second uh point you made um apart from uh, liberalization sorry just remind me the second was the sort of differentiating between a kind of oh, yes 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 and a kind of yes of yeah and now now that is a now to me this is the point this is the really important point um why do people conflate social liberalism with radical progressivism because as you say they are very different radical progressives are illiberal francis fukuyama's book identity is very good on this yasha monk's new book is also very good on this Radical progressives are illiberal because they have no interest in individual rights. They prioritize fixed group identities. They reject the scientific method. They reject research and evidence, which which undermines their claims. They are pretty uncomfortable with the values of the Enlightenment. They reject um, our, the national story of who we are, our history, pretty much. Then they're they're cynical, if not, you know, they they repudiate our our past and our cultural inheritance. However, where, why I think people conflate social liberals with radical progressives is because, and this will be a provocative point for, 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 for people listening, is I don't think social liberals have done enough to take on radical progressives. And I think social liberals have been too quiet. And I think social liberals have, and I've seen this in universities, when you have an activist minority, which is radical, at times revolutionary, that wants to completely reshape an institution or a way of life, the moderates in the room often feel quite scared and anxious and not sure what to say. And I think over the last five years and increasingly over the next 10 years, social liberals, I hope, are going to come to the conclusion that they need to mount a much more robust defense of who they are, what they believe, 
and why they are different from radical progressives. Uh, that is essential. And if you look at the more in common research, which I mentioned, you know, they have these sort of subgroups and there's radical progressives. And, and another one would be establishment liberals, let's say liberals. Um, and I think that is one of the political battles that is going to be important because radical progressives are already being strongly opposed by conservatives. Um, and it's going to be quite easy for for, for national conservatives, not liberal conservatives, but national conservatives to say, look, these are all the people that are basically not not mobilizing any response to to this challenge to our, our, our identity and history. So I think social liberals, Ryan, have a, a really important decision to make, which is are they going to make that case robustly and loudly? And are they going to take on this illiberal um, political strand in our politics? Interesting. Um, and there's so much, you know, I would sort of challenge, but also agree with on that. But I'm in the interest of time. I'll, I'll come to my last question, which is much more political, which is you talked about the, the Conservatives making a fatal decision recently, uh, which will really kind of, you know, they'll really suffer in, in the next election as a result of that. I mean, I take some challenge with the idea that it's just recently that the 2019 Conservative voters have been abandoning the Tories. I think they have been now for some years for a mixture of reasons, disappointment with Brexit, I'd agree with that. and public yeah. services deteriorating. Um, and it's interesting what you said about, you know, Rishi feeling more establishment, whereas the people who tried to break the mould, like Liz Truss and Boris, you know, eventually got uh, got chucked out. But always my impression of Rishi is actually compared to his predecessors, whether it's on immigration, whether it's on fiscal policy, on environmental policy, is what you would might define as more to the right. He's certainly more fiscally dry. On immigration, he seems to be not as permissive as Liz Truss and Boris was. On environmental policy, he's cooler um, on net zero than than Boris and Liz. So it, I just it almost feels the perception of Rishi as one as a kind of urbane liberal metropolitan but actually his sort of deeper instincts are more conservative mm. and i wonder perhaps why he's sort of not doing so well in the polls is that he's appealing to neither group because neither he's sort of falling between the cracks and i'm interested in your views on that i think i think it's a good point um if you look at some of the surveys of mps that we've had um, from uh, a few think tanks over the last few years, you know, they show pretty consistently that most Conservative MPs in a parliamentary party, not all of them, obviously, but most of them lean more to the cultural left than the average voter, even within the Conservative Party. Um, and that's also true within the Labour Party. So what we have overall, and I'm painting some broad strokes, but we have a political class which really is in quite a different place to most voters when it comes to issues like migration, legal migration, not just illegal migration, um, multiculturalism, woke ideology, um, diversity, um, all those kinds of issues. And um, I think Rishi Sunak, I agree with you instinctively, he is more socially conservative than some of his critics would have voters believe. However, when you look at the centrepiece of that 2019 manifesto, you know, when you look at the promise to lower migration, lower migration not just deal with the small boats which weren't so much of an issue then were beginning to be an issue but not not massively so leveling up the country um redistributing or at least sending power and influence to other parts of, of britain um that agenda really was not delivered on any serious level by boris johnson or liz truss um boris johnson liberalized the legal immigration system. There was no real, I mean, there wasn't really high skilled migration. The salary thresholds were brought down to 23,000 or in some sectors, 20,000. Um, international student migration was liberalized alongside the dependence of international students and net migration soared to 604,000, partly because of high refugee numbers, but also because the, the system generally was was liberalized under under a conservative government. And that also included much larger numbers of low-skill migrants, particularly from areas like sub-Saharan Africa, who have been shown to be a net fiscal cost to the economy and also now tending to dominate social housing in areas like London and, and elsewhere. 
So the conservative record, which Rishi Sunak inherited, was a was a bad one, in my view. It just did not reflect both what the party said in its manifesto in 2019 and did not reflect the aspirations and the demands that voters had in the aftermath of Brexit for a different political economy that wasn't dependent upon importing cheap labour from abroad, that wanted to invest in British workers and that wanted to send power, not just government departments, or pots of money that were going to be decided at the centre to, to regions outside of London, but was going to send power and influence down to towns and, 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 and regions outside of London. And so by the time Rishi Sunak really became prime minister, obviously without a, a mandate um, from voters, um, in some sense, you know, his premiership was already defined. It was going to be very difficult for him really to do anything to, to try and put that coalition back together like Humpty Dumpty and Rishi Sunak is is also not as popular as Rishi Sunak tends to think he is his leadership ratings are not that great and the Conservative Party's ratings overall are I think in the latest Ipsos tracker I think their net score is minus 60 which is not far off for, for a reference point to where Prince Andrew is he's minus 65 minus 70 which gives you some sense of where the Conservative brand is because it's it's hoovered up Boris Johnson, Partygate, Liz Truss, inflation, cost of living crisis, small boats. It's just kind of hoovered up all of these issues. And Rishi Sunak is unable to make any cut through, both because he's unpopular, but also because he's now carrying around this very unpopular political party. And when it's come to the, the few issues that I think he could have really cut through on, he has consistently, in my view, backed off. I've been told by more than one cabinet minister that the party no longer sees legal migration as a problem, that primarily this is about small boats and this is about trying to shore up the borders. And they've come to some sense of peace or consensus around sustaining net migration at certainly upwards of 400,000, 500,000 for the foreseeable future, uh, which I, I would argue is, is, is really, you know, I don't want want to use the word betrayal but it 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 is it is doubling down on a political economy that is fundamentally broken that is built around consumption and keeping labor costs as low as possible for big business um and as a consequence i think voters have become utterly exasperated so that what we what we're heading into i think ryan is is a protracted philosophical ideological civil war over what is conservatism what is conservatism in britain and i think as i've written this week there is going there are going to be establishment tories there are going to be liberal conservatives and there are going to be national conservatives and they're going to have to decide what direction they go in and i don't I, there are some issues where they simply will not see eye to eye and i think immigration will be one i think the extent to which you know the we are willing to leave anything that prohibits us from controlling our own national borders will be another. The extent to which we see radical progressivism as a sustained serious threat to our way of life uh, will be another. Uh, our willingness to get engaged in, in the sex-based rights of women uh, and the rights of children will be another. Family policy will be another. Do we want to just simply encourage women back into the workplace as quickly as possible? Do we want to actually have a sustained policy that is going to encourage people to have children, that is going to encourage us to actually deal head on with this demographic crisis that we're facing? And also, lastly, you have very different ideas of what the state is all about and what free enterprise is all about. You know, do we want a state that is um, that is just simply small or do we want a state that is small but strong, which is willing to intervene in the national interest? And do we want an economy that is based around global markets, global interests, um, deregulating financial services of, as a first priority, removing a cap on bankers' bonuses, or do we, do we want an economy that's fundamentally about prioritising the national community, prioritising the interests of the national community? And when you look at what's happening with the Republicans in America, Conservatives in France, in Sweden and elsewhere, I do think the direction of travel is moving very quickly on the centre-right. And we are now going to have that same debate in Britain after the next election. Yeah, I agree that that debate, that debate will happen um, and happen after the election. I think there'll be a big battle on the centre right um, for the direction of conservatism in this country. 
So let's open it up to questions from people from the floor. So I'm going to just bring up three because there's loads of people who have asked questions. So the first is from Caroline, who says, is it surprising the creation of radical progressives happened under a Tory government? Should we be concerned about this growing under a Labour government? So that's the first question from Caroline. Uh, another, The second question is from Phil, who says, why should I be discriminated against because I live in a big city, went to a certain university or have a certain job or certain job or because I'm not deprived in any form? Um, uh, and then a question from Lottie, who says, how do we ta tackle entrenched intolerance in unintegrated groups such as anti-Semitism, homophobia among Muslim communities in what feels like a very liberal London? So three questions there. OK. Um, the first one, sorry, remind me the... The first one is around the rise of radical progressives yeah. rising under a Tory government because <clears throat> it's going to get even worse under a Lib uh, Labour government. I think, I think um, it's a really good point. I suspect Conservatives will come to regret not taking a tougher stand over the last decade. Um, what's happened essentially is that a very illiberal ideology is now fully embedded within higher education, parts of the schools, the primary and secondary schools, civil service, BBC, among others, and um, in many taxpayer-funded institutions. We now have a worldview which I do not think is remotely interest in, interested in promoting the interests of the national community, of the nation state. And a lot of that has happened under the Conservative Party, which has consistently pulled back from entering into that because partly it's bought into the narrative um, of that ideology that sex-based rights for women, the rights of our children, not to see them as being interesting because of their race, but rather their character, um, our history, our identity, our culture, these are all now packaged up as uh, culture wars, um, which should not be debated and discussed, which are considered to be somehow low status or socially unacceptable. And I've heard many conservatives over the last few years say, well, these things are culture wars and the conservatives aren't interested in stoking tensions or uh, inflaming culture wars, when in fact, these issues are the foundations of our civilization. These are the things that ultimately define who we are. They define our country and they define uh, they define our national community. So conservatives should, I think, have played a much more robust role at doing things like, you know, blocking the entrenchment of critical race theory in primary and secondary schools, which they could have done. Gillian Keegan has consistently kicked that down the grass, as have previous education secretaries, uh, reforming the institution so they're not politicised. Um, dealing with in a more robust manner the uh uh you know the the some of the points that Suella Braverman made around policing where to many voters out there the double standard that she referenced has been visible for a long time we took a very robust response to covid protesters and we then apparently gave black lives matter demonstrators a free pass during the covid uh, uh pandemic and to many people that seemed like the institutions were playing one side rather than playing both sides fairly. Um, so I think the Conservatives will certainly have to reflect on, on that. Um, if you look elsewhere around the world, obviously some Conservatives have been much more interventionist. If you look at the US Republicans, they have been much more willing to intervene in institutions. Some of them have gone too far, but they have been willing to discuss, okay, should this be on a school curriculum, teaching that America is institutionally racist, or you know, should we be... Uh, uh, extending the influence of, of a radical gender ideology in elementary schools you know is this really what we we want to teach the kids is the science there to support this um are these contested beliefs actually backed up by serious empirical evidence or is this actually a political project um in terms of uh, the second question I, i'm not certainly calling for anybody to be discriminated against what i am asking members of the new elite class people who live in the cities people who who are from that class the reason I wrote the book is just to say, well, perhaps maybe members of that group could reflect on how the socially and economically liberal consensus of the last 30 years has really alienated much of the rest of the country. Did they always make the right decisions? 
is there a way that we can perhaps bargain and negotiate our way to a compromise? What would that look like? How could we give more say and influence to people who do not belong to that group? Have we always treated our fellow citizens with respect and dignity, such as in the aftermath of the Brexit referendum, where it seemed as if many people in the ruling class were insulting the rest of the country, forgetting that the rest of the country were in the room with them? Um, and it was a very low moment, I think, in our national life. So I'm certainly not calling for anybody to be discriminated against. I am asking for some some reflection and I am asking for some changes um, around uh, the inclusion of different voices in the institutions and also um, some consideration to how the values of other voters and in some cases the values of the ma majority are included in the policy making process. And I think that is going to be critical to strengthening um, our society going forward. I think there was one more question, Ryan. Yeah, I mean, on on that, I, I think, you know, the thing that Phil was really touching on was this sort of, you, you're rightly, you know, being sceptical of viewing the world in this communalist way and sort of groups pitching against different groups. And I suppose, you know, don't fall into that trap when describing young urban graduates that they all think the same and you know are all the kind of new elite so it's sort of avoiding that same communalist thinking when you're mm. thinking about those types of people as well the <laughs> final question which um i mentioned was lottie so she was talking about how do we tackle oh, yes. intolerance in unintegrated groups yeah talking about intolerance around anti-semitism homophobia uh, very very important question very important question and and and, and alluding i think to the events of recent weeks um Look, I, I felt very uncomfortable with the way in which we as a country have responded to the atrocities committed against um, against Jews and Israel. Um, I felt very uncomfortable with the coverage of, of Hamas in the BBC and other sections of media. Um, and as I said on Politics Live a few weeks ago, I trying to imagine what it would feel like to be a British Jew at the moment is a very depressing experience where it seems as though many people within our national and public life are really refusing to call out um, terrorism and anti-Semitism. Um, what could we do? I think fundamentally this comes back to a point that Suella Braverman made um, which is around the failure of our policy of multiculturalism. And I, I, I had a bit of a debate with Hugo Rifkin about this because I, I, unfortunately, I think he misinterpreted what Suella Braverman was saying. Suella was not criticizing multicultural society. She was criticizing multicultural policy. And they're two very different things. I think what we have had over the last 20 years is a policy and indeed a national conversation that has consistently prioritized group difference over commonality. And that has been now, I think, enabled by the rise of and the radicalization of the cultural left, which is pretty adamant at allowing minority groups, demanding that minority groups retain their religious, cultural, racial, ethnic distinctiveness, that they are not forced, pushed, encouraged to assimilate into wider British life. And I think inevitably what we are going to need to do as a society is take a step back and think much more seriously about how we are going to encourage the integration of minority communities into wider British society and how we are going to reassert British values. Because the era of us being tolerant of people who are not tolerant of our way of life I think it has to come to an end. Uh, that is going to be a recipe for fragmentation and polarization. Uh, where people glorify terrorism, where foreign nationals glorify terrorism, um, I think like the former Home Secretary said, and like others have said, 74% of the country think this, that they should be removed from the country. Uh, and I think we need to start drawing some lines in the sand as to what it means to be British and what we expect from people when they become part of this national community. Because if we don't start to do that, as Robert Putnam and others have shown, in highly diverse societies, levels of social trust decline. 
and in highly diverse societies, support for things like public welfare can often start to decline as well because citizens no longer feel as though they're part of that wider story. So they tend to withdraw, they tend to hunker down, and they tend to become less supportive of helping their neighbor and helping their friend and helping their fellow citizens. So we need to move quickly now because the problems are very visibly escalating. Um, I would personally advocate that we have some kind of moratorium on migration for a period of time so we can absorb uh, and integrate the migration of the last 20 years, which has been historic in its scale and its speed. And we can begin to focus on bringing people together rather than continuing to expose them to a very radical cultural and political project, which corresponds with the beliefs of many people um, in London and, and, and SW1 and, and the ruling class, but which is clearly leaving much of the rest of the country feeling profoundly anxious um, and disillusioned. It would be very, very hard for, for people in the group that I'm describing to accept that, and they will instantly oppose it. But I, as I say, I'm profoundly worried about where this experiment is taking us, because we've never been here before. Britain has not always been a country of mass migration and rapid social change. Um, this is new. Uh, and if we don't get ahead of it and think very seriously about these challenges, um, I think the protests and demonstrations of the last few weeks, I think, are just a taste of what is going to be coming uh, down the line in the years and decades ahead. Great. Thank you, Matt. So it's the final five minutes. So I've just got three more questions. Um, uh, the first question is from Vicky, who says, but the 2019 Tory coalition, the electoral coalition, weren't truly conservative in many ways under Boris Johnson. So why is it wrong for party to return to more effective coalitions, i.e. the Cameroons? Uh, the second question is, uh, well, I suppose it's more of a kind of statement which is a bit of a challenge to you which is an anonymous person who says is using language like purged and elites not very divisive when discussing political questions so that's just a statement um and then a kind of second question uh is from an anonymous person again are ministers giving up on cutting legal migration because they know it's not their problem it will be starmer's labor problem and then it's just a final question for me i mean i'm you know, and at Bright Blue, we believe very strongly in the importance of institutions. Um, and, you know, part of my problem with the, Sir Ella Braverman's comments around the police were that, you know, there's also been a challenge that the police were heavy handed during COVID, that they were heavy handed with the uh, visual of, for Sarah Everard, for example, and that they use stop and search disproportionately on BME communities. And I think of another great institution, the BBC, and there's lots of attacks, for example, of how it's covered the Israel-Gaza conflict. And certainly it's definitely got uh, some of those things wrong. And I've been critical of them for that. But equally, people on the left always say, well, look at all of these Tory stooges in high uh, senior positions, how you describe the period of deficit reduction as well. A lot of people on the left thought the BBC were biased about that. So uh, I suppose my question on just to get to the essence of it, my question around institutions is, is the threat not more from heavily political people from either side of the spectrum rather than just progressives, that people who are political activists, um, you know, I'm not saying institutions are perfect, they sometimes need reform, but is the threat to institutions more from intensely political people than necessarily intensely progressive people only? Okay. So just give me a word to remind me of the first question. Sorry, my, my memory is not what it was. <laughs> yeah. So Vicky said about the 2019 coalition not being no. necessary. Yeah, sure. So let me let me take that one quickly. Um, OK, so the strategic dilemma facing the Conservatives, essentially, you know, do you pivot back to trying to win the Cameroon coalition um, or do you try and carve out new tech, new territory in places like the Red Wall and so on? Look, my my view, if I were advising Rishi Sunak, what it's worth, or the Conservatives, I'd be saying, I'm afraid that going back to the, the Cameroon electorate is not really possible now, given the legacy of the last 13 years. The, the Liberal Democrats, as we can see in the by-elections, both the Lib Dems and Labour are over overperforming their polling numbers. Um, the Lib Dems are likely to do much better now than they did in um, 2015, you know, 
going after the southwest is not going to be a particularly viable strategy for the Conservative Party amid the, the sharpest cost of living crisis for 50 years and against all of the problems that we've seen. Um, and also the Labour vote is, is much stronger today than it was in, in, in the big cities, university towns, a commuter belt, places like Canterbury where I teach, um, which really underlines the need for the Conservatives to do what the Conservative Party has always done in history. The reason the Conservative Party is the most successful political party in the history of democracy is because it reinvents. It, it reinvents its electorate and it reinvents its appeal. And the party really was given a unique opportunity to do that, to reinvent. To, to It could have focused on really delivering on that 2019 manifesto, which, by the way, I thought was probably one of the best manifestos the party's had in a long time. And it could have focused relentlessly on expanding areas like the Red Wall. There are another 35 seats up in northern England, the party could have targeted. It could have made much more headway in areas like Wales. It could have, you know, that's not to say it needed to give up on the areas like the Blue Wall. We often talk about Blue Wall, Red Wall as if they're kind of irreconcilable. But the party has clearly now decided to prioritise those southern urban university educated areas. And I would just say to the party, if you think voters in those areas are going to vote Tory, after the last 13 years, after Brexit and Boris and Liz Truss, um, I I have a bridge to sell the party. I just don't think it is going to happen. Um, it's not even the best strategy for damage limitation. You know, that if, if the party is trying to limit its losses, then I think it would make much more sense to focus on doing that by giving itself a foundation for a much more uh, viable coalition going forwards and by targeting issues that Labour are weak on. Um, so it's going to be very difficult for the party. The second question, Ryan, was... The second question, well, there was a statement just on language. but the Oh, yes, on language. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, but look, there, there has been a purging of voices from the public square and from institutions. I mean, we've seen that. I, I perhaps have been shaped by my experience within universities. I've seen people like Kathleen, Kathleen Stock be harassed, discriminated and bullied until they lose their jobs. Um, Noah Carl, Neil Thin, Eric Kaufman, Jordan Peterson, among others. I've seen what this group do to people when they merely challenge their ideological beliefs. and. Um, I do firmly believe that this group is an, is, a, is an elite group because it largely dominates the institutions that shape the national conversation and dominate the public square. So I do think it is a an elite. It's not the only elite, but it is an increasingly important elite group within society um, that is now competing with the old elite for power. And indeed, that old elite, as we can see with things like woke capitalism and DEI in the corporate sphere, has now recognized the power of this new elite and is trying to manage it, albeit cynically, perhaps hypocritically, but is nonetheless embracing many of the ideologies and narratives of radical progressives. Now, you can see that also in areas like the NHS, um, where we're spending about seven billion pounds a year on DEI, anti-racism type initiatives in an institution that we're also told doesn't have any money. Um, so I think we really need to get real um, about the scale of the challenge. And sometimes language, <clears throat> even if provocative and challenging, you know, it does help to get a national debate going. Um, and uh, we might need to agree to disagree on that. And the, the third question, Ryan, sorry, before I get to yours. I was... suppose it was a kind of cynical interpretation of why Tories have given up on legal migration, on cutting it. Yeah, just no, it's it's it's, it's so I think it's a really good point. I don't think it is that cynical, though. I, I just don't think many people within the Conservative Parliamentary Party wanted to reduce legal migration. I think they came under pressure from both the party's donor class and big business, as we saw. And they they backed down and they said, we're not going to force business to wean itself off, of, off an addiction to cheap migrant labour. And we're going to keep going with the status quo. And um, I do think the Conservative Party is going to regret that. I think it's it's also going it, it's enlarged the amount of space for some kind of alternative vessel to the Conservatives. And if not, it's going to stoke considerable degree of apathy among many working class Conservatives who are looking for meaningful changes on that issue um so i and but the underlying premise of the question is also right these problems are going to mount labor has no credible plan for dealing with illegal migration 
listening to Yvette Cooper last night talking about smashing the gangs. I don't know anybody within the National Crime Agency or elsewhere who thinks that is a serious policy for dealing with this crisis. You get rid of one gang, it's quickly replaced. We need a deterrent in a third party, third country, maybe not Rwanda, but somewhere else. You know, Italy's now doing it. Germany's considering it. It's only a matter of time until the EU starts to do it. We need a visible active deterrent so people do not risk their lives crossing the channel. And we need a hard humanitarianism. And if we're going to talk about legal and safe routes, then we need to also talk about what the limits to those are and how we're going to determine the limits. Um, so I just generally think we are still very lost when it comes to that issue. And lastly, Ryan, I completely agree with you. I think one of the problems, you know, at the, at the moment, we've got a lot of activists. Everybody's an activist. Everybody wants to change the world, both on the right and the left. But we do, within the institutions, I think, have a homogenous, um, uniform culture, which does lean itself more to allowing um, the cultural left to have more influence. Um, I mean, look at what the incoming Labour government is proposing to do, the racial equality uh, laws, which would basically determine government contracts on the basis of race and ethnicity. I mean, this is this is like woke 101. Um, look at uh, what has been um, tabled in Scotland, you know, with the Gender Recognition Reform Act. OK, it didn't go through, but it was definitely something that people work quite hard to bring about, allowing 16 year olds to legally change their gender without any medical supervision. Um, these are ideas and immigration too, you know, that I think are going to accelerate in, in the years ahead. And it may be that, as one Conservative MP said to me recently, it may be that it's better for the Conservatives not to win the next election, given that if Rwanda, if the Rwanda plan fails, we have another hot summer. If net migration next week or when the numbers come out, I think the end of this week or next week, net migration continues to increase. The small boats crisis isn't resolved. Maybe, God forbid, we have some kind of security issue related to Israel Gaza or continued protests and demonstrations until that conflict comes to an end, which won't be for a long time. Um, who would want to win the next election? You know, that is not going to be an easy climate, especially when there's so little fiscal, there's so little headroom in the in, in in the economy. You know, we've got masses of debt, we've got low growth, and we've got um, still low productivity um, and a cost of living crisis that, that many voters are going to continue to feel for the next couple of years, not just through mortgages, but local council tax bills, through food prices. Yes, inflation is beginning to come down, but 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 not really that much. Um, voters are still going to be feeling this cost of living crisis because they've been tied into higher interest mortgages or their rents have gone up for the next 12 months. It's going to be a very, very difficult context for a Prime Minister Starmer and an incoming Labour government. And it may actually be that, you know, in some respects, comparisons to the 1970s are correct. It may be that actually we do end up with some kind of short term coalition government or some short term uh administration um the only question is who's today's margaret thatcher <laughs> perhaps an opportune moment to leave it there yes thank you thank you matthew and thank you everyone for for listening and for your questions sorry if i wasn't able to uh, ask some of the questions that you that you put forward um so just to say our next lovegate lecture is with richard reeves uh who is uh now uh, in the us at the brookings institute uh and he's going to talk about the role of men in modern society. So that's our Ludgate lecture for next uh, month. So please watch out for that. Um, thank you so much, Matthew, for your time and thoughts. Some very challenging, thoughtful um, stuff in there. Um, so we're, we're very grateful for that. So a kind of virtual round of applause to you uh, and to say good evening to you and good evening to everyone at home. Thanks very much for